On this slide we can see liver. Stain is hematoxylinonosine, name of the slide is a portal liver cirrhosis. Liver cirrhosis is a terminal condition of the chronic liver disease associated with an intensive growth of rough fibrous tissue, exactly with fibrosis and structural rearrangement of hepatic parenchyma, resulting in the formation of the false lobules. And there are numerous classifications of liver cirrhosis. Main classifications are based on etiology and pathogenesis, both reflecting peculiarities of microscopical changes in liver. As well, we can use macroscopic classification of liver cirrhosis. Here on the slide you can see etiological classification and the main pathogenetical classification as well as macroscopical classification. At low magnification, the hepatic parenchyma is presented by the lobules surrounded by the connective tissue septa. These lobules are false as they have no central vein and no typical arrangement of hepatocytes in the form of beams within those lobules. These are the characteristic features for false lobules. Also, on this slide, we can see a phenomenon of converging threads, which is revealed as a decreased distance between the nearest threads or portal tracts. At high magnification, we can see that the beam-like arrangement of hepatocytes is impaired in false lobules, and we can't find central vein in the majority of those lobules. Also, we can see growth of rough fibrous tissue around the lobules, mainly around the and along the portal tracts. Lymphohistiocytic infiltration is also found there. Some hepatocytes in those lobules undergo degenerative and necrobiotic changes. In particular, the changes which can be seen are typical for intracellular fatty degeneration. The liver cirrhosis is an irreversible process. Its complications include progressing hepatic failure and portal hypertension syndromes. These patients could have bleeding from esophageal veins, which undergo dilation due to active functioning of the portal anastomosis, and it is one of the most frequent causes of death in such patients. Also, the patients in liver cirrhosis suffering from especially chronic hepatitis C have a considerably higher risk for hepatic malignancy, exactly hepatocellular carcinoma. On this slide, we can see kidney. Stain is hematoxylinonosine. Name of this slide is extracapillary proliferative glomerulonephritis. According to definition, glomerulonephritis is a bilateral diffuse of focal non purulent inflammation of the renal glomeruli, resulting in renal or extra renal manifestations. There are few types of glomerulonephritis. According to etiology, there are primary, secondary, and hereditary glomerulonephritis. According to cores of disease, acute, subacute, and chronic, and according to morphological criteria, can be divided into intracapillary and extracapillary, as well as exudative, proliferative, and mixed. The extracapillary proliferative glomerulonephritis with the crescents presented in this slide is a subacute rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis, which is usually accompanied with a nephrotic syndrome. As to this slide, at low magnification, we can see renal glomeruli, tubules, and interstitial tissue. The main changes are found in the glomeruli. In the most of the glomeruli, we can observe arterioles compressed by proliferative podocytes, macrophages, and finally fibroblasts. These proliferated cells occupy the space of the Bowman's capsule, creating the so-called cellular crescents, which later are changed by the connective tissue and form the fibrous crescents. 
Among other changes, we can find degenerative and necrobiotic changes in the tubular epithelium and some features of sclerosis and lymphohistocytic infiltration in interstitial tissue. The morphological changes of glomeruli functionally manifest in the form of glomerular filtration impairment leading to renal failure. On this slide again we can see kidney. It is stained by hematoxylin and eosine. And name of this slide is chronic pyelonephritis. In contrast to glomerulonephritis, the pyelonephritis is an inflammation of pila cellical apparatus and tubular interstitial component of kidney parenchyma. Generally, it is caused by infections, and it could be acute or chronic, manifested as one of the types of exudative inflammation, mainly serous or purulent. At low magnification, we can observe major changes in microscopy of renal parenchyma. It should be mentioned here that the morphological changes found in kidney are as deep and severe as the course of chronic pyelonephritis is longer. It is also important to mention that the changes can be observed not only in tubal interstitial elements of kidney but in glomeruli as well. However, the glomeruli changes are to be considered as a secondary. As we can see here, most of the glomeruli undergo sclerosis, and some halinosis can be identified. The same changes are found in the wall of the vessels and the interstitial space. Diffuse lymphohistocytic infiltration also can be seen in the interstitial tissue of the kidney. At the same time, as tubular interstitial elements are affected primarily, the main changes are found in renal tubules. The most of the tubules in this slide are dilated and filled with homogeneous eosinophilic masses, which have an appearance of colloid. The tubal epithelium becomes flattened. Atrophy, degenerative and necrobiotic changes are found there. Such microscopical appearance is usually called as a tyrodization or thyroid kidney, as the dilated renal tubules filled with colloid-like substance have an appearance similar to thyroid gland follicles. Progressing of atrophy, sclerosis, and halinosis in all the structural elements of the kidney result in formation of pyelonephritic secondary shrunken kidney, which is an outcome of chronic pyelonephritis. On this slide, we can see a thyroid gland. Stain is hematoxylinosine. Name of the slide is a diffuse toxic goiter. According to definition, Goiter is an enlargement of thyroid gland. It can be diffused or nodular, and it can be accompanied by increased or decreased functionality of the thyroid gland. Diffuse toxic goiter, which is also known as a Graves disease or Basidu disease, is an autoimmune disease accompanied by the increased serum levels of thyroid hormones and related to a number of clinical manifestations found almost in all the organs and systems. At low magnification, we can see the thyroid follicles having different size and irregular shape. At high magnification, we can know that the follicular epithelium becomes higher or cylindrical. The follicular epithelium formations make some outgrowths of false protruding inside follicles, which is typical for Graves' disease. And such formations are commonly known as the Sanders pillows. Sometimes, the colloid substance undergoes dilution if the colloid is reserved actively. And that can be seen in the form of colloid vacualization within the thyroid follicles. Also, some diffuse lymphohistocytic infiltration can be seen in stroma of the thyroid gland. On this slide again, we can see a thyroid gland. Stain is hematoxylinosine. Name of this slide is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Same as Graves' disease, the Hashimoto thyroiditis is an autoimmune disease. However, controversial to Graves' disease, it is accompanied by the severe hypothyroidism and express typical morphological changes. 
At low magnification, the structure of the thyroid gland is non-homogeneous. We can see clearly expressed basophilic areas composed of lymphocytes and plasma cell infiltration. At high magnification, we can see small thyroid follicles which are lined with the flattened epithelial cells. The most typical features are diffuse infiltration of thyroid gland by B lymphocytes and some plasma cells, replacement of follicular cells and formation of the lymphoid follicles with the light germinative centers. As a result of thyroid parenchyma lesions, also its replacement by connective tissue can be seen. We can see fossae of sclerosis in thyroid gland with some areas of fibrous tissue replacement. Also regeneration of epithelium and epidermoid metaplasia takes place in follicles where hortal cells also called as Ashkenazi cells can be seen. These morphological changes lead to a considerable decrease of hormone production of thyroid gland, means very pronounced and severe hypothyroidism. On this slide, we can see part of the uterus, in particular in mucous membrane, which is endometrium. It is stained by hematoxylin and nosine. Name of this slide is glandular hyperplasia of endometrium. The endometrial hyperplasia is defined as proliferation of endometrial glands with an increased gland to stroma ratio more than 1 to 1. That means that glands occupy more than 50% of tissue section. Generally, these changes occur as dishormonal conditions, and they are divided into simple and complex types. They also can be with atypism or without atypism. In this slide, we can see a pattern of complex endometrial hyperplasia without atypism. At low magnification, the two basic components of endometrium are clearly seen, which is glandular components as well as stromal components, where the glandular component is increased and it occupies the greater part of histological section. At high magnification, we can observe some typical glandular formations of endometrium, which have several peculiarities in their structure and location relatively to each other. Firstly, some glands get twisted appearance and they are called as a corkscrew shaped glands. Due to increased amount of glands, some of them are located too close to each other, and such glands are known as back-to-back -back glands. Epithelial proliferation in some of the glands shows the appearance of pseudostratified epithelium, where it seems the epithelial cells to be located in a few layers. Some changes are also identified in the stroma, hypertrophic changes, some features of chronic inflammation means evidences of chronic endometritis manifested by the diffuse lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltration. On this slide, we can see a uterine cervix. It is stained by hematoxylin and nosine. Name of the slide is healing endocervicosis. Endocervicosis or cervical pseudoerosion, also known as a glandular erosion, is a pathological condition based on metaplasia. 
In this case, metaplasia is presented by replacement of non-carotenized stratified squamous epitinum by single-layered glandular epitinum. And three consequent stages are distinguished in the course of endocervicosis. These stages are progressing stage, then the stationary stage, and finally healing stage or reepitalization. At low magnification, we can see outer surface of uterine cervix covered by the non-carotenized stratified squamous epitinum and inner surface of uterine cervix or endocervix lined by single-layered glandular cylindrical epitinum. Stromal elements and glands of uterine cervix are visualized in submucous layer. At endocervicosis, the changes occur on outer surface of uterine cervix, where the stratified epitinum is replaced by the glandular epitinum. At higher magnifications, changes in epithelial lining are found at the site of healing endocervicosis. Due to healing process, the stratified epitinum grows upon healing site, while some glandular epitinum still remains under growing new epithelial lining. Cystic expansion of glands, called nebothian cysts, is found in submucous layer, which is typical for healing stage. It occurs due to stratified squamous epithelium growing and covering the excretory ducts of glands. It obstructs the ducts, preventing its free excretion. The secretion accumulates in glands, which expand and turn into small cysts. Generally, the metaplasia is considered as a precancerous lesion and epidemiological factors remain acting, for example, human papillomavirus, and no treatment is taken, the metaplasia can turn into dysplasia, means cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, seen, and then into cervical cancer, mainly adenocarcinoma. On this slide, we can see part of the fallopian tube. The stain is hematoxylinosin. Name of the slide is ectopic tubal pregnancy. In ectopic pregnancy, the embryo is attached outside the uterine cavity, including fallopian tube, ovaries, abdominal cavity, uterine cervix, or maybe rudimentary uterine horns. On this slide, we can see discontinued pregnancy. At low magnification, we can see small areas of mucous membrane of uterine tube, numerous chorionic villi, and large hemorrhagic area. At high magnification, the chorionic villi are presented by the trophoblasts, which are syncytiotrophoblasts and cytotrophoblasts, as well as stroma of the chorionic villi. The changes related to desodulization process are found in mucous and submucous layers of fallopian tube. Such changes occur due to embryo implantation into the wall of the fallopian tube and is manifested by the presence of the large cells with the large nuclei. The outcomes of tubal pregnancy are either tubal abortion or abortion resulting from fallopian tube rupture.